Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented small law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through the Lawyerist Lab and Accelerator. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Aaron Street. And I'm Sam Glover. And this is episode 311 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, we are highlighting one of our most popular episodes with Neil Tyra, where he shares all the things they didn't teach you in law school. Today's episode is brought to you by Postali, Cosmolex, Text Expander, and ESQ.marketing. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So, Aaron, I'm back uh, because you and I wanted to talk about uh, this whole Ross Westlaw business uh, that hit the news a few weeks back, but still feels pretty ripe and relevant. Yeah, there are a few different moving pieces here. One is, if people aren't kind of up to speed, that Ross Intelligence, which is a new-ish startup. God, they don't feel new anymore, but they really still right. are, aren't they? I mean, in, in the startup context, <laughs> yeah. they're a few years old, right? Uh, in the legal research space, competing against Westlaw and LexisNexis, um, that Ross announced a few weeks ago that they are shutting their doors because of damage done to their company uh, in the wake of a big lawsuit from Thompson related to copyright infringement um, in the basis of... Is it worth sort of summarizing the claims or... Yeah. And then I also wanted to add <laughs> that we... Yeah, well, we can dig yeah. into it a little bit. And then I also wanted to add that kind of since we decided to talk about this topic, then also in the last few days, it was announced that Fast Case and Casemaker are merging. Oh, right. Um, yeah. And given kind of the nature of the dynamic of these legal research software companies, the kind of consolidation and change in the marketplace has been really rapid in the last month and a half. Yeah, legal research is more exciting than usual. Yeah. <laughs> and so it feels like kind of the whole category of the topic, um, given that it's so core to many lawyers' practices, but also that it feels like such a weird beast for most people to even think about. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like kind of a category of stuff we could talk through for a few minutes. Yeah. I mean, plus Ross is involves AI and and robot lawyers and things. Yeah, and which... we, we couldn't have you back on the show without <laughs> at least saying the words robot lawyers. If you if you talked about robot lawyers and AI without me, I'd I'd be sad. Exactly. Um, so maybe to start, it might be worth kind of teeing up as way of background this specific Thompson Ross lawsuit without getting too much in the weeds because we don't need this to be that conversation, but a little framing to have a conversation about what's going on in that space in general. Yeah, I think the substance of Thompson Reuters Westlaw's claims is that Ross hired a third-party consultant to generate test data for Ross's search engine. So essentially, Ross needs to be able to, to say that um, if you search for a breach of contract on Ross, you're going to get good cases. And in order to figure that out, they need test data so they can feed it to their AI and um, and say is it right or not? And the consultant apparently, allegedly generated a lot of that test data through their own Westlaw account. And so the allegations in the lawsuit are that that was a breach of contract by everybody involved, I guess, and and things like that. So, but that that seems to be mostly the substance of the lawsuit. And, and Ross's defense is we explicitly told our consultant not to do that. Um, and other things, and but it it implicates much larger issues, I think. Yeah, and and from a legal basis, it's simultaneously that using a Westlaw account for those purposes is for sure a violation of the terms of service of your contract mm -hmm. with Westlaw, Definitely. but also that Westlaw claims copyright in the data they have in Westlaw. And so using it outside of the things you're authorized to do is then a violation of their copyright, which then gets extended to yeah. Ross if they knowingly used copyrighted data inappropriately is the idea. We didn't talk about this while prepping, but 
Uh, this lawsuit may have more significance for summer associates who are asked to use their Westlaw account for their small firm <laughs> employers than anything else. I mean, it's it's not an <laughs> uncommon thing, right? Yeah, apparently. Yeah, but there's a there's a lot more going on here, and I guess the end of it is like, I don't think Thompson filed this lawsuit caring whether it won or not. Um, potentially, I, I don't want to ascribe motives to them, but. One of the natural consequences of suing a startup is that they can't raise money while their existential threat is pending. But what's also going on here is questions about, <laughs> is the law free? Do you have to pay for access to the law? Do you have to pay for services that collect the law? How can you make money building a startup that builds tools to help people find the law and those sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy and a lot of people did early on in the wake of Ross's announcement they were shutting down. It's easy to jump to the kind of David and Goliath story mm -hmm. here um, and really think that Thompson is trying to stifle all innovation and that people who are building new stuff are good people and people who own legacy stuff are bad people, et cetera, et right. cetera. Yeah. The fact that we <laughs> have personal relationships with people at Ross means like there's a natural tendency to want to defend our friends. Um, I actually have no inside information to know whether this lawsuit has merit or not and who should right. ultimately win it. And therefore, like, I'm not trying to pick sides there. It is very possible that Thompson filed this lawsuit as aggressive competitors for the purpose of stifling an innovated competitor. It is also possible that... Whether or not it intended to do that or not, though, that is... That is the effect. That is what happened. No question, yeah. that is the effect. Um, it seems... Just as possible that their corporate counsel say, we own IP rights to proprietary things and other companies are now making money off of using our proprietary things. It is literally our job as corporate counsel to enforce our rights to the IP we own. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know if you guys remember, but I always, I remember seeing the notice on, you know, that we had the Westlaw printer in, in the law library. I, I don't know. Do they still have that? Do, 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 do they use still paper use paper? Yeah. I don't even know. Um, God, I, see, now I say shit like that that makes me feel old and sound old and whatever. Yep. Anyway, uh, every single page would have that copyright notice that I think said something like Thompson Reuters or Westlaw claims copyright in the annotations, not in the text. But the effect of that is like, as far as I can tell, if they find out that you are publishing their text with their annotations, they're going to sue you for it. And that question about that has always been like, well, if if Thompson is the sole publisher of the case reports, for example, does that mean there is no way to get the law without paying for it through Thompson? And that that's kind of what the open access to law thing um, circles around, because Thompson has for years essentially asserted that um, if we're the only reporter your SOL if you want the law. Right. And not just Thompson. I mean, this is the nature of all of yeah. the competitors in the legal research space that mm -hmm. LexisNexis has the exact same motivations. And there have right. been all sorts of lawsuits with Casemaker and others yeah. um, about both the fact that all of these annotations and metadata are almost certainly proprietary, but also that some states and jurisdictions have licensed the rights to the data whereby yeah. a company can actually Clearly therefore, bullshit. well, yeah. yes, and, and yet it is <laughs> happening where a state says only XYZ company has rights to publish our data. And at that point, it is their proprietary data, right. at least according to current interpretations of what that state has done. And it felt like the legal research game for a while was just adding page numbers so that it was now yours to sell. People can't reference it without using your intellectual property. And and so it felt like the 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 way the market operated was just trying to put page numbers um, and headings on as much law and then and then you owned it and now that was your piece of the market. And I think where the rise of fast case and case maker sort of in parallel is the story of is also the story of that, but it's also about, I think, that they have had to fight for open access because how do you get access to that law and add it to your database if you know you've got other people claiming intellectual property rights in it and so there have been a number of lawsuits and questions around like obviously nobody can own the law that's ridiculous that feels obvious to me at least that doesn't mean nobody can own manifestations or collections of the law 
but the law itself has to be open or we don't have a democracy. It's that doesn't work. Yeah. And for those listeners who want to dig into this question more in the six years of this show, uh, you've probably had a dozen conversations oh, yeah. with activists and law librarians about the really important nuanced constitutional issues, philosophical issues around what it means to have access to the law um, as a right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't need to go way deep on that because you've had right. all those conversations. You might even have it's a few deep. favorites that are worth <laughs> pointing people to. Um, and so there's that issue underlying all of this, but in a context where there are like funded billion dollar companies and funded startups trying to be billion dollar companies, it is becomes really hard to then decouple the righteousness of innovation for its own sake versus huge financial implications and therefore right. litigation that flows from that of people trying to capture their rights and dollars and things. I think I can sum some of that up by pointing out, I mean, I think Fast Case is sort of um, helps me explain what's going on here just because I know that on the one hand, Fast Case is a, you know, a nimble, leveraged uh, legal research company where they have dozens of employees versus Thompson's Westlaw's hundreds or thousands of employees. Um, and Fast Case's whole thing has been, we're going to try and do this with, you know, we're going to scale rather than just throw a huge amount of work at it. But yet I know that I'm, a huge part of their budget is tied up in just getting the law into their database, right? I mean, <laughs> you pointed out while we were prepping, like I, I'd forgotten about this, but they are literally shipping containers of books to China to have them scanned because that's how you get access to the law. There's no, it's one thing to say, obviously the law can't be copyrighted. It's another to say, okay, here's the book, do what you want with it. Right. <laughs> and so, so there, there's so much time and money still tied up in that. And when we've had conversations about this previously, it's sort of imagine a world where you could build whatever startup you wanted on top of that law because it was easy to get access to. That's a, I mean, that's kind of the, the utopia that, that we all, well, some of us think that we would love to have. And that we most decidedly do not <laughs> yeah. currently live in. Yeah. Right. And in that, in that utopia, like that's where this, the issue that Ross is having doesn't even arise because Ross could just do Ross things without all of this mess around, um, how do we get test data or <laughs> how do we get, how do we get the substance of the law that we need? They could focus on building a tool that helps you analyze, get access to whatever to the law. Yes. And at the same time, if it were that easy, then even a story like Ross probably wouldn't exist because even Ross raised millions and millions of dollars with the goal of being a billion dollar company, even if a newer and more nimbler one than Lexus or Thompson. And therefore, like, even they don't look like a bootstrapped little company that's trying to just play around with free open data. Yeah, it's a totally different thing. And I think on the one hand, legal research was boring for so long, right? There were two big companies and there was, and then for a while there, there, you know, fast case started becoming more and more viable and that started getting interesting, but it wasn't like it's legal research. It's, it's pretty esoteric for even many lawyers, but imagine if all you had to do was, you know, quickly search the established open API enabled body of law. That'd be a whole different story, but instead where we are is it just takes so much effort to assemble the law. And so you, I, I mean, for a long time, the conversation about Ross wasn't about does the AI work? It was about, yeah, but do they have, you know, case law and treatises from Wisconsin? <laughs> yep. And so it was, it was almost like we didn't get to focus on the cool stuff. Instead, we had to focus on, yes, but are they able to get the law that we need them to have all of i'm not sure that we have like a bow to tie this all up in oh, yeah, but I, I was just um, thinking about try, how to get back to that <laughs> yeah but because legal research is a core part of a lot of people's practices it is fascinating that in the last month or two we went from six major players in that market down to four in the matter of mm -hmm. weeks with the closure of ross and the merger of case text and fast case now you've got Lexus and Westlaw as the big gorillas. Can we have Lexus and Fastmaker? Potentially. Um, <laughs> Fastcase and, and Casemaker have decided to merge under the name Fastcase. And then there's still Case Text as like the one scrappy startup left. Right. Um, 
And so it's a different landscape. I'm not sure that this extremely long intro conversation uh, clarified all of it, but hopefully for those of you who are curious about some of those dynamics, there's at least some new stuff and new framing to think about. And now here is Sam's conversation with Neil Tyra. Well, hi, my name is Neil Tyra. I'm an estate planning attorney who practices just outside of Washington, D.C. on the Maryland side. And at the same time, I'm also a podcaster. I have a podcast called The Law Entrepreneur, and I do a as good a job as I can balancing those two acts and wearing two hats at the same time. And I think in part, my ability to do so is as a result of the fact that law actually is my fourth career. Wait, what were the first three? <laughs> well, I cooked for a living. Mm -hmm. Initially, I cooked all over the city of Annapolis, if you're familiar with the area where the Naval Academy We is. didn't cover this, but I'm I'm from Northern Virginia, so absolutely. Uh, so you know Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And then I spent 20 plus years building hardware and software systems for the government, primarily for NASA mm -hmm. and for DOD, largely in the space program, but ultimately in air defense. And I left that because uh, they were looking for a scapegoat for a contract that didn't go well, and I figured it was going to be me. Mm. And uh, so I exited stage left after 20 years. But all along, all during that period of time, I was a practicing martial artist. And so when I left the IT world, I opened a commercial martial arts studio and taught hundreds, if not thousands of students, the Japanese art of Goju-ryu karate. Mm -hmm. And, but all along, I'd always had an inkling and always thought that I wanted to be an attorney. And I had a couple of friends who went to law school later in life and it got me to thinking, you know, if, if that's something I want to do, I need to start thinking about doing it now. Cause I had two kids getting older getting ready to head off to college and I was going to have to beat them to the, you know, to the money <laughs> uh, supply. <Right. laughs> and so I decided, well, let me see if I can at least get in. And I was lucky enough to be accepted at the Catholic University of America. And then I had to make a decision and I sold the martial arts studio and went into semi-retirement in that respect and started law school full time. And I've been an attorney now for 15 years. Very cool. I did not realize that you had that awesome background. That's pretty cool. And a circuitous route. <laughs> it's really just a question of I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Sure. Yeah. Have you figured that out yet? Not quite, because I just added this podcasting thing a few years ago, too. So, <laughs> Well, tell us about that. So you're on, I think, episode 160-something now? Just about that. I recorded 175 today, so we've got gotcha. a few okay. in, the, uh, in the works. So, yeah, I was always a podcast junkie, and I used to listen to a lot of podcasts, a couple of whom the guests have been guests on your show. One of yeah. them uh, was The uh, Art of Manliness with Jordan Harbinger. Mm -hmm. And I heard a guy on there who I know, and I started talking to him about his experience on the podcast. And I thought, you know, I, I think I want to do a podcast. And originally I thought I was going to – I always like to hear the, the stories of the veterans of the legal wars here in the county in which I practice, which is the city – is the county seat – and I thought I was going to do a podcast like capturing their memories and what it was like to to practice law in the, in the 60s and 70s. And, mm. and I figured that would last maybe three or four months. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd run out of uh, people to talk to. And right about that time, an uh, individual who I went to law school with made a terrible mistake and lost their license. And they did so, in my opinion, because nobody taught them how to run a business. And they made a couple of mistakes and it cost them. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking about the question, how does law school prepare us to run a business? And it doesn't really. It may prepare you to how to practice law, but if your only opportunity, and for some folks that I graduated with it during the, um, the economic challenges that we had in the mid-2000s, uh, their only opportunity to recover and pay off the student loans was to open their own practice and hang mm -hmm. out their shingle. And for some of these folks, they didn't know how to write a check. Yeah, It's just not something they'd been taught. And I'd already made a bunch of mistakes owning my own business as a martial arts studio owner. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I figured I'd already knew the ropes. Little did I know there was a whole new set of mistakes to make, <laughs> right. which I uh, <laughs> very cleverly uh, accommodated. But so I said, well, what happened if I do a, a podcast 
that addresses what it teaches about running a business in law school. And that's kind of how the genesis of it got started. And then the prospect of, of getting free advice along the way yeah. kind of intrigued me because, as I said, I made a lot of mistakes. I, at the time, I was working with a couple of coaches that I had mixed results with in terms of growing my practice. And I thought, well, OK, if I do this podcast, I can pick the brains of the successful and accomplished attorneys and find out what they did right, what they did wrong, what they wish they might have done otherwise and we'll start from there. So that's the bulk of our guests or successful solo practitioners. Yeah. Uh, hmm. But then we added entrepreneurs, people who have a skill set or an idea with respect to entrepreneurship that lawyers and, and small solo practices might benefit from. So that's the second category. And then lastly, I have what I call gadget folks. Being a tech nerd that I am, mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to interview <laughs> people who had a product or a service that attorneys could use. For sure. And so that's the bulk of our guest base. Cool. And then your practice is family law and estate planning. And is that just you or do you have more people working with you? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a true solo, or as I like to say, I have a three-man firm, me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a reformed litigator. When I, uh, when I went to law school, I thought I was going to go to the state's attorney's office. I did all my internships and Rule 16 lawyering uh, for the state's attorney's office here in the county. But I had just a crisis of confidence right at, at the moment that I graduated and said, well, let me see if there's anything else out there that would appeal to me more. And I took a position with a small boutique practice in the District of Columbia doing personal injury law. And I did that for a while. And then my son at the time was a pretty accomplished soccer player played at a very high level. I knew he had a chance to start uh, on the varsity as a freshman and he was getting ready to go into high school. And I wanted to be able to see all of his games without having to ask anybody. So here's where, you know, I make <laughs> these decisions that sometimes work out, sometimes, you know, don't. I just said, ah, I'm quitting. I'm starting my own practice. <laughs> awesome. And I figured, you know, I owned my own business. I'd made all those mistakes and, you know, how hard could it be? So I just walked out and started my own practice, and fortunately, it's gotten me, uh, you know, through the day. Very cool. So you said a few things in there I want to follow up on. Yeah. One is you mentioned coaches as just an aside. Do you still have a coach, and kind of what's the role that they've played for you? Now, actually, you know, I don't currently, and um, I keep going back and forth about whether or not that's something I want to pick back up again. Mm -hmm. I had mixed results. I had some great experiences and some great learning, some great growth, and then I had some stagnation. And so, you know, if it had been smoothed out a little bit more for me, I think I would have been more receptive to continuing. But I went through those peaks and valleys, as, as, as I now understand we all do with coaching. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I, I'm not currently using a coach or a mentor but I have a lot that come on the program, so yeah, I, can get, sure. I get a lot of benefit there. But it's not, you know, directly hands-on and one-to-one. -one. I mean, it's I suppose it's one of those things where it's kind of like a personal trainer. Sometimes you're able to get to the gym and participate and be enthusiastic about it, and sometimes you're not. Correct. And I think the analogy is really apropos because, you know, some trainers have a different approach, and it's not always a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. methodology that works to help you know, build your body nor your law practice. It has to be complementary, right? It does. It has to work for you. And, you know, I think there's a whole plethora of, of coaches out there. There's a, there's a lot of them in the legal space. You know, I'd suggest to everybody that kind of sample around. You look around and find if there's something that resonates with you. You'll know it. Right. You know, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Mm -hmm. But if it feels right and you, you're getting what you need – then I think coaching can be really, really valuable. Right. Yeah. Having somebody to help hold you accountable and, and shape uh, your See, don't say, and, yeah. well, yes, don't, don't really? say that. Well, really? You don't because, like accountability? No, nah, that was the big problem for me. Oh, say more. <laughs> yeah. You know, as a true solo, you can change the rules. Mm -hmm. And so that was the biggest problem for me. We'd set up a goal and then I would not be accountable to the schedule and the goal. So I know it was less the coach's problem than it was mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the more you realize your own fallibility, that you are the cause of the problem, unless you fix it, 
it's just going to continue. Mm. So I had to work on that myself. Yeah, interesting. And I'm still working on it. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So I want to talk about something else, but we have to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and then we can just go off. So we'll take a few minutes off and when we come back, we're going to talk about that idea of what we should have learned in law school and what we think law schools ought to be teaching. So we'll be right back. Support for today's episode comes from Postali, a full-service legal marketing agency for law firms. The attorney-client relationship is the cornerstone of the legal profession. Just like you put the client's needs first, you deserve a marketing agency that does the same to grow your practice. Postali works with law firms nationwide and is the only full-service legal marketing agency that can call itself a marketing fiduciary. That's because, at Postali, the impressive results they achieve come from always putting your law firm's financial interests above their own. Imagine a relationship with a legal marketing agency that treats your investment as they would their own dollars, without hollow SEO promises, no commission-based upselling, and who won't work with your competitors. Postali is the marketing agency for legal professionals looking for 100% transparency and genuine guidance from a real marketing partner. To learn more about the benefits of working with a marketing fiduciary, visit postali.com forward slash lawyerist. Contact them for a free consult and mention this podcast. Support for today's episode comes from Text Expander. Get ahead of your productivity for the new year with easy to use cross platform snippets. Text Expander makes quick work of mundane, repetitive tasks so you can focus on what matters most. Say goodbye to needless text entry, spelling and grammar errors, and inconsistency in your messaging. When you use Text Expander, you can say the same thing, the right thing, in just a few keystrokes. Text Expander can be used in any platform, any app, anywhere you type. These versatile snippets are better than copy and paste, and they're better than scripts and templates. They work across devices and platforms to allow you to maximize your efficiency while still customizing and personalizing your messages. So take your time back in the new year and increase your productivity with Text Expander. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more. Support for today's episode comes from ESQ Marketing, an agency that believes in affordable and reliable marketing for solo practitioners and small law firms. With ESQ Marketing, you'll work with experts in legal marketing. All of their intense focus is on helping attorneys generate more clients and cases from the internet. They don't work with anyone else. You'll breathe easy with low-risk, month-to-month contracts, and there are no long-term commitments. ESQ Marketing earns the right to work for your firm each and every month. Best of all, you'll get direct access to the person working on your account, no account managers to deal with, and no lost-in-translation with your requests. To see if you're a fit, visit esq.marketing forward slash lawyerist to get started. So Neil, we're back. And uh, before we left, we've been talking about your podcast. We've been talking about coaching. And I wanted to follow up on something else you mentioned, which is, you know, one of the reasons you started your podcast was realizing all of the skills we didn't learn in law school. And I've been talking a bit recently about, you know, lots of people object to the idea that law practice is a business. It's a profession, right? It's not a business, which I find asinine, but it's out there. <laughs> and yeah. and one of the things that often gets thrown out there is it's a profession. We're bound by a rule of ethics. But one of the things I've noticed about those rules of ethics, which I'm bound by as well as a lawyer, is that most of them don't have anything to do with your competence to practice law and solve legal problems, right? Like the most common ethics violations are around balancing trust accounts and client communication and billing and things like that. And those are all business skills that nobody taught you how to do in law school. And so I'm wondering if you're getting at things like that and what else, what else is encompassed in the term entrepreneur that you chose for your podcast that you wish lawyers were getting more of in law school? Well, that's a hundred percent correct. I find it infuriating that the ethical restrictions that are placed on attorneys, as you said, aren't really geared around their proficiency or their worthiness to practice the profession, but rather to run a business. Mm-hmm. And so the, the quickest way, and, and ironically, I was just, the episode that I was recording this morning was with another guest that you've had on, uh, Megan uh, Zavarea. 
And we talked about, you know, how attorneys get themselves in trouble mm -hmm. as business owners, things like not being able to properly manage the escrow account or not adhering to the ethical limitations for uh, advertising and and the like. And it's it's a paradox that attorneys as business owners, and let's make no mistake, if you are a solo practitioner or a small firm practitioner and you own the firm, you are a business owner. And frankly, you're a business owner first and an attorney second, because if you can't solve the problems of running a business first, you'll never get the opportunity to be the attorney. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you run out of money and you can't keep the doors open, you can't pra you're not going to be able to practice law, at least under that, you know, that name, that shingle. I mean, that there, there's at least three legs to the stool, right? You've got to be a, a professional. You've got to be a lawyer and serve your clients. You've got to run a business and you have to manage. You have to do the fine. You've got to do all the administrative stuff as well. So, yeah. And so the, the angst that people have when they come on my show is how do I balance those three things? Mm -hmm. And particularly when I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I, nobody taught me how to negotiate a lease for office space. Now I suggest that the first question you should ask really, if you're going into, into <laughs> solo practice is, do you need office space? Right. Question everything. You know, I, you know, when I talk about one of the mistakes that I made, that's one of the mistakes that I made because I just thought in my brain that I needed physical office space to practice law. And, you know, I didn't. And so there was a lot of money. I won't say that it was wasted, but it was spent where it could have been spent elsewhere Yeah. on a physical space to practice out of. So questions like that, but nobody taught me how to negotiate a lease. And my first lease was horrible for me. <laughs> Yeah, but fortunately, I had enough money to overcome that. And then nobody taught us how to attract clients, how to market our business. How do you generate new business? But we're professionals. We're not supposed to worry about that stuff. But if, but if you don't have <laughs> clients coming in the door, you're not going to have a profession. Yeah, no, and I it's agree. a catch twenty two problem. Nobody taught us how to staff an office and how to hire and how to do reviews and how to pay employee taxes. You know. None of that was taught in law school. I mean, when you, you know, every year Thomson Reuters does a survey on the state of small law firms where it goes and asks small firm owners and leaders, what are your challenges? And their challenges are getting clients, getting paid and getting things done, not how do I figure out, you know, the rule against perpetuities? That's that we figured out. Those aren't the problems and the major challenges law firms are having. 100% yeah. true. And uh, I hear it every time somebody comes on the show it's one of those three things. Mm -hmm. So when you, if you had a chance to go and run your own law school, would you be doing like general accounting classes and, you know, basic landlord tenant for business classes? Or how would you go about designing a curriculum that is modified for the realities of running a law firm? Well, I think it is borderline legal malpractice on the part of the law schools, not to offer a, an entire track through all three years on how to operate and, op and, and sustain a law practice. I think you should be able to take classes in law firm operations and law firm business development right alongside constitutional law as a mm -hmm. 1L hmm. all the way through. Because there are some folks who know or who have a good sense that I want to practice on my own when I get out of law school. And so I'm going to study the substantive law and professional ethics and rules of evidence and all of that. But alongside it, I want to know, you know, law firm accounting. I want to know staffing issues, how to how to hire people, what to look out for. I want to know how to negotiate, as we said, a lease, if that's what I mean. Right. <laughs> Whatever's right for you. <laughs> I want to know how to use technology. And that's another problem. Mm-hmm. You know, for an uh, individual to prosper, I think in this day and age, you have to leverage technology to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And there's so much capability left on the table because these folks are first trying to learn the law and then trying to figure out their way how to operate a law firm. They don't have the time to devote how to use technology to do all of the above. Right. And so a geek like me had a tremendous advantage because I knew how to use some of the tools. And now you're starting to see a little more of that. I think particularly with the younger law students that are graduating, they have a firmer grasp on the use of technology and they're a little more entrepreneurial in the, in the sense that they're willing to try stuff than maybe 
you know, the attorneys that graduated with me or before me. Yeah, that's probably true. We could fix law schools all day, I suppose. Mm. Um, <laughs> but we should drag ourselves out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you what, what, what does annoy me, though, mm-hmm. is when they offer a one credit program, you know, as a third year student. Right. And think, right. OK, look, we handled it. Yeah. <laughs> one ninetieth of your law school education is going to handle a third of your practice or, exactly. or more. Yeah. yeah. So when you look back over your own law practice, you've teed yourself up by this by saying you started a podcast in order to talk about your mistakes. So yeah. give me give me one of your top mistakes. Like what is one of the biggest mistakes that you made that you think other people could benefit from knowing about so that they could avoid it? I jumped in way too quickly with a nationally known and recognized provider of legal services who offered to do my website for me. <clears throat> Fine law. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> And I did so because one of my good friends, who's very successful, had her uh, website um, developed in that fashion, and I liked it. What I didn't realize was that mine was going to look exactly like that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of money wasted in uh, in that area and a lot of time. So that was one of my bigger mistakes. You know, that that really, to me, is a great example of one of the things that I also struggled with when I was starting my own firm, is we have a tendency to ask other lawyers for advice without taking the time to understand the context for it. And and like at that point in your practice, you probably weren't able to understand the context either, just as I wasn't. You know, like right. I picked up Time Matters early on, and, and if I hadn't hated it so much, there wouldn't be a lawyerist. So I guess, you know, yeah. that's a thing. But I did that on the advice of other lawyers, and I didn't know better than whether or not I should trust them. And so I just took their advice because, hey, more experienced lawyers, because we have this thing about experience which is kind of not all that helpful. Like, I would have needed to know that somebody was sophisticated about law practice management in order to know that their advice was worth taking. But all lawyers really want to know is, is this person more experienced than me, and are they successful, and what do they think? And that's always the struggle when it comes to software or marketing strategies or anything is like, I'm not sure that we're very good at taking the time to figure out whether or not we should, somebody else's advice is worthwhile. And it sounds like you kind of fell into that trap too. For sure. And and the thing that irritates me in, about my own actions is that, again, I'm a techie. I'd spent 20 years in hardware and software systems. I could have done my own website. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could have done my own <laughs> website better and, and, and more efficiently. And, but I thought, you know what? I, I'm not going to be so presumptuous to think that that's the case. This website looks great. And, you know, it was a disaster. So that was an eye opener. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes you have to hit me over the head multiple times for the lesson to sink in. Oh, you too. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> One of the things I like about the practice of law is that if you're in a practice area, that you don't like, or for whatever reason you want to change, you can do so. It's really pretty simple. You just get yourself up to speed and start rededicating yourself to a different practice area. Had I thought about it more when I started, I wouldn't have gone into litigation. Mm. I would have gone into exactly what I'm in doing now, estate planning, because I'm not, I don't consider myself old, but I'm older. <laughs> when you get to this part of your life, uh, you don't want to be tied down by the court schedule. At least mm-hmm. I didn't. And I, and had I thought that through a little bit, it would have been self-evident to me. And I could have started as an estate planning attorney a long time ago and been a lot more effective, I think, at that. So that, that was another, I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but it was a, a bit of a waste. That's a really good observation that I've had as well is like litigation means a whole lot of externally imposed deadlines that you right. can't do much to move and that mean you go to jail if you miss them. <laughs> or lose your license, right. <laughs> right. Like it is really hard. Like somebody else is dictating your moves constantly and you know, you cancel vacations, you miss kids games, whatever, because a judge thinks you need to have a trial or a hearing the next day. So indeed. Yeah, indeed. So those are a couple of the big ones. There's a whole plethora oh, of I smaller well, ones. That's people can just go listen to your podcast and get more. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I should say too, like, I don't think find law is bad. There is a firm that find law is a good fit for. I think one of the mistakes they've made is marketing themselves to a lot of firms that they're a poor fit for. 
And then people get angry about it somewhat rightly because it's a bad fit. So that disclaimer out of the way. I imagine in doing your podcast, you've come up with a lot of things that you've been able to bring back to your practice. Can you think of one of the top things that you've taken away from your podcast that has gone back into your practice and benefited your practice? Yeah, I can. You know, when I first started, because I was a techie, I knew that I had the resources to connect to my hardware and software systems at the time from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was before the cloud. So it was a little more complicated than it is now. But I wanted to be able to run my practice from my laptop from wherever I was. And lar largely, I was able to do that. What? Because now I'm going to geek out for a minute. What, what did you use? I'm an Apple fanboy, an unabashed yeah. Apple fanboy. So when I started... I knew I wanted to stay Apple, and there weren't a lot of hardly any practice management software uh, platforms available at the time. Uh, Daylight by Market Circle was more of a customer relations management platform that I could realize I could use to run my practice. And so I chose that. Clio and Rocket Matter were two emerging stars that were just getting started, and I didn't think they were mature enough. At the time, again, and I know then what I know now, I might have mm -hmm. made a, di a, a different choice. But uh, Daylight is great for me, and I've stayed with it. They were a very fine sponsor of my podcast for almost the entire length of time oh, that cool. I've been doing. So we we're not uh, sponsorship relationship anymore. But I still sing the praises of Daylight by Market Circle because I still use it. Nice. My system was even more janky. I, I was using Linux Ubuntu at the time, Ubuntu Linux oh, at the time, and uh, and Dropbox hadn't been released yet. Right. So I was syncing up my files manually using rsync over static IP addresses from home and work. <laughs> you my... were literally rolling your own. <laughs> I was rolling my own big time and it worked fantastically yeah. well, but it was, it was pretty janky by comparison to the easy way people have it now. So... <laughs> but one of the things I brought back out of the podcast that I never, uh, never thought about. So the technology part, I was kind of up to speed on, and I've been improving little pieces of it uh, mm -hmm. back and forth. But we had Ryan Levesque, who wrote a book called um, Why. Mm. And, and basically, the, the premise of the book is to talk about getting the answers to questions before you implement a solution, which seems to be self-evident. But yeah. I oftentimes embark on a solution and then find that it doesn't exactly fit what I thought the problem was. But my estate planning practice is geared primarily to younger clients. And I wasn't getting the kind of conversion that I wanted. And so I started a survey and I asked these clients, you know, what what is the hang up? What is the challenge that you have about getting started with an estate plan? And I thought it would be things like, well, I don't think I have enough assets to make it worth my while, or I don't want to think about death or, you know, this kind of standard things. The answer that I got back and the one that completely floored me was, we don't have the time to come to your office. Mm, mm -hmm. I said, oh, wow. Because, yeah, well, I got to take time off from work or, or the, the spouse has to take time off from work or I got a kid and got this going on. And, well, how about if, if I come to you? Nah, then I got to clean the house. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> I got to put the food away. All right. Well, how about if we, if we were able to do this online? via tools that we use now, Skype or FaceTime or Zoom, video conferencing and an exchange of questionnaires and material back and forth and scanned documents, would that be helpful to you? That would be enormously helpful. Yeah. So my practice is really kind of now gearing around to almost, I wouldn't say exclusively, but the vast majority of my clients I service online. I feel like lawyers don't give enough respect to that viewpoint, which is a very true thing. Like I'm looking at hiring a landscaper and I filled out two contact forms on two different landscape companies, websites, both of which came personally recommended. And I asked both of them to respond by email or text. And one did and one left me a voicemail. And the one that left me a voicemail, I don't intend to do business with. Okay. A, because they didn't respect my choice. But B, because like, I just don't have time for phone calls. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so screw them. Like I, I need somebody who's willing to work with me in the way that I'm able to work. And it makes all the difference in the world. But I also don't think most enough lawyers do exactly what you said, which is just ask. Like your clients have the answers that you think you have. And you may be surprised by them. It's so valuable. So Yeah, I'm chasing all different kinds of theories as to why these young millennials 
aren't setting up estate plans while, while they can right now. Mm -hmm. And it, it really came down to, gee, just driving to your office, having to take time off from work or meet you in a coffee shop or whatever, that is a problem for me because I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And it's so often a simple thing like that too where, I mean, it's simple and not, but it's the unexpected thing that you can absolutely solve that problem with a couple of simple tools. That is so often the case where like, you know, I'll start revving up some big solution for our website or our, our community platform or something in order to fix a problem where people aren't engaging or something. And it turns out that it's actually just, I needed to flip a switch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or uh, I, we didn't see it. It was on the wrong side of the mm -hmm. screen. You know, if you move it right. over to the left, oh, there it is. You know, that kind of thing. So, and I would never have thought of even asking the question had it not been the lesson I learned from my podcast. Yeah, that's really smart. So Neil, since I have you here, I haven't, I don't think had too many podcasts with tech oriented, future oriented estate planning lawyers. But as you know, we love to talk about the future of law practice yeah. and that like one of the most common tropes, I'll say, in talking about the future of law practice is how estate planning is mostly going to get taken over by intelligent forms and AI lawyers. And so I'm curious what you think about that. What are the future prospects of your chosen practice area? Well, I think overcoming that belief is the major challenge that estate planning attorneys have. Because, I mean, let's face it, companies like LegalZoom are spending a fortune marketing mm -hmm. via all kinds of platforms and channels to get the message across that you can use them to get your simple will and estate plan done. And I'm not suggesting that that's not viable. It's not the best solution. Yep. And so overcoming that is a challenge. And I think if, you, if you're not able to address that question head on and directly as to why a potential client ought to use you as opposed to this online uh, opportunity or a dozen like it, if you're not able to address that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to not turn out well. And so a lot of people say, well, the way to address that is to lower my price and race to the bottom. Mm and compete with those uh, platforms on a cost basis. I don't think you can do that. You have to provide value to your client base as an estate planner, and they have to actually really feel like they have a relationship with you and that you understand what their personal issues are. Because let's face it, when you do an estate plan, you're talking about almost the most intimate aspects of your family and your, your own personal life. Other than you know divorce and custody, which I did do, really hard pressed to find you know, an aspect of personal relationships more uh, intense than what happens when I pass and what happens to my family when I pass. And I suggest that the robots hmm. and the AI enhanced platforms that seek to address that issue can't come near enough close to understanding that relationship to make it worth their while. How do you get a chance to make that case to your potential client when LegalZoom can outspend your marketing budget probably a thousand times over? Well, for me personally, it's just that, being personal. Mm. Like if you go to my website, I have this wonderful video that we did that doesn't really talk about me as an attorney. You see me walking with my wife and you see my house and, you know, my friends. And, you know, I try to establish an opportunity for a potential client to have a visceral connection with me before we ever talk about anything with respect to their estate plan. And most people come to me and say, wow, I loved that video. I feel like I know you. Or I've listened to your podcast. I feel like I understand who you are. Or I've watched your other videos. And uh, you speak to what concerns me. And that's how I think you differentiate yourself from a commercial, you know, a 30-second commercial that talks about the value of a company like LegalZoom, which, again, you know, I'm going to say can be the right thing for some people. Mm-hmm. Neil Tyra, thanks so much for being on our podcast today. Listeners, if you'd like to catch up with Neil, you can go to thelawentrepreneur.com to find all of 170 as I'm recording this episodes of the podcast. I'm sure there'll be a couple more out by the time this goes live. And uh, we'll obviously include the links in the show notes. So Neil, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Sam, it has been a pleasure of mine and just you know, one of the highlights of my week to say that I was on the Lawyerist podcast. So I'm a avid listener to your podcast. And I, and I say that with all honesty, uh, you guys do a great job. Your, your blog is fantastic. 
fantastic. I read it all the time. And I couldn't be more thrilled to have taken the time to be with you today. And I do appreciate it. Oh, you got me blushing now. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> The Lawyerist Podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Christopher Eng. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discuss here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read The Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. 